because of it, uh, kind of had people trust me more, even though I didn't have direct experience that I could at least understand the basics of the, the business of multifamily investing. And so, yeah, it was a, a great resource. The best, uh, I don't know how much you charge for it today, but the best, like, you know, a few hundred dollars that I ever spent. Jason, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having me, Michael. Excited Man, to be here. Yeah, yeah. so you are full-time and you quit relatively recently and built a, a sizable portfolio. And we want to understand that. We also believe that uh, numbers are important for investing, which is outrageous. Definitely want to look and in, get into that. But how? What was going on in the time when you? Why were you thinking real estate? Uh, think back when you're real estate, because I know you have some single family houses as well. Go go all the way back and go. Ooh, probably start with rich dad, poor dad, like everyone's crazy journey began. But what was going on in your life where you were scratching your head, going, "Huh, I should look into real estate." What What was going on then? You know, so I was a, a point in my corporate career where I felt like I was kind of tired of listening to other people tell me what to do, which, uh, again, comes from a place of coming from a immigrant family. Uh, my dad has always been an entrepreneur, so he always wanted me to go into corporate America, but I always wanted to be more like him and kind of start my own thing. Mm. And I knew that I wanted to do something on my own and real estate seemed like the perfect vehicle to start building generational wealth. And uh, I mean, I, I love other investment avenues. Crypto is, is, has its own benefits. Uh, stocks have their own benefits. But real estate seemed like the uh, the only investment vehicle that I could directly more have a control over and kind of build that wealth brick by brick versus, you know, kind of you know hoping for other companies to, to blow up or anything like that. Was there a particular reason or pain point that you decided to get into real estate? Like, I know you obviously have trouble with authority. Okay, I, I get that. You don't want to be told what to do. But is, was there any kind of like moment when you when it kind of hits you that you need to do something different? Uh, you know, funny enough, because I'm a data person, I, I try to look up how most people build generational wealth. And time and time again, all the statistics say that most of the millionaires in the United States are built through real estate. So I figured... Uh, I mean, I'm a statistics person. I'm a, I'm a data guy. So I got to follow what the data tells me. So uh, obviously, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into uh, just because I, I had no background in real estate. But uh, in hindsight, yeah, I couldn't be more grateful to to pass Jason for making that decision uh, <laughs> because I am where I am today because of that. Now, so that's interesting that you came up with that. Most millionaires, billionaires are actually real estate. Um, and and so what was your initial strategy, right? Was it was it multifamily that you're in right now? Was you, Were you thinking something else in the beginning? Uh, yeah, I, I start off in single family homes. Uh, my uh, mentality is of that, that I'm someone who likes to do something once, but hates to do anything twice. So I need to get down in the weeds to understand the nuances of how a specific business or, you know, whatever machine works, but I'm also uh, hyper efficient and I love building processes and systems. So I want to be able to offload as much of the manual labor as possible. And so without any background in real estate, like I honestly barely understood how a house kept itself together. Uh, I didn't even have my own primary home at the time. So I figured I had to start, uh, you know, relatively small, but even the first real estate transaction I did, I bought six single family homes at the same time because there was just a, a good opportunity for me to kind of uh, pick that up. And so uh, only by going through the pain of hiring a property management company, going through all that effort, meeting with them weekly, uh, meeting with the contractor on site, uh, babysitting them you know, once a week for, for three or four months at a time, did I feel like I'd be able to get the hands-on experience I needed to succeed in larger assets? And so start off in single family homes, but with the full intention of uh, scaling to multifamily eventually. I didn't realize I would get sick of single family homes so quickly and move on to multifamily almost immediately afterwards. Uh, but yeah, that, that was sort of how my journey started. And uh, now, I always had a, a plan for bigger things. Now, okay, that's an interesting thing. Where does that come from? Because a lot of people spend years investing in single family houses until they, like me, until they finally scratch their head going, oh my gosh, something is wrong. I don't know what it is, but something is wrong. Now, and so you being a data guy, you got started with a single family house with the intent of doing something bigger in multifamily. Why? And, and why did you come to that conclusion early on? Did the data, data lead you there some, somehow or, or why did you uh, come to that conclusion? Yeah, I think part of it is like I, I'm such a big proponent of systems that once you have the system into place, I feel like, you know, everything else is kind of just uh, a mental block, uh, like taking care of seven single family homes or 10 single family homes is about as complicated as taking care of one single family home. You just have to have 
you know, more scalability in time, or maybe you hire an assistant or, or something to, to deal with some of the admin stuff. And so um, I guess part of it's also impatience. Uh, I wanted to, to get to the level of having a few multifamily units. And I knew that uh, buying one house at a time was just going to be, you know, many, many years of hard work versus I could buy a 10 unit or a 15 unit in one given location and scale a lot more efficiently that way. Uh, I, I figured out even from owning this, a few single family homes, uh, the property management company would charge me hourly for a maintenance guy. And even driving from one address to the other would charge me 15, 20 minutes of his, uh, you know, $40 an hour rate. And I realized that even little things like that add up. And uh, similarly, the property management company that I could find that could handle six units versus the ones that I can find to handle, you know, 30, 60, 80 units, the, the quality is also different. So um, the more that I did research into real estate, I, I saw a lot of well-established people say that it actually gets easier the larger you go. And uh, so I, I kind of just, I worked through the uh, emotional hurdle of being scared of bigger numbers and just decided to kind of go for it, uh, feeling confident in the systems that I built. All right. Well, let's talk about that for, for a second, because let's talk about some of the motions you had. Right. So, I mean, biting off a six six house portfolio is, is actually also pretty significant. I mean, a lot of people have trouble buying a single you know, duplex or townhome. But what were you going through at the time when you're buying those houses and then maybe even your first uh, multifamily deal that you kind of felt you were struggling with, you were stuck with? Oh, yeah, I feel like I struggle with uh, almost everything. Uh, I, I bought uh, in the uh, peak of COVID era which was arguably the worst market to, to buy anything in, in the last decade. Uh, and, you know, without any experience, it's really hard to project the obstacles that are ahead of you. So even like, you know, last minute, the, the lender wanted me to freeze uh, X amount of money so they'd be more comfortable. Uh, having contractors that didn't work out, I'd have to fire them and try to, you know, get new contractors to pick up the slack. Uh, going over budget on projects because we opened up walls and found out a bunch of stuff that I didn't know before. And so I felt like it was a uh, an entire year of just running into obstacle after obstacle. But part of what got me through it was this uh, idea that if I can find a modicum of success in the hardest market of the last decade, everything else moving forward should be easy. And so I kind of I, I set like a, a time frame for myself. I expected the first year to be incredibly difficult, which it was, but I, I assumed they would get easier. And I kind of use that as like the light at the end of my tunnel. And uh, I mean, it actually, that's kind of how it uh, transformed my journey. Like as soon as I started getting a little bit of traction, start taking down, you know, a little bit of multifamily, found my current business partner. I feel like the world opened up and just traction is such a magical thing. Yeah. I mean, the, the first deals are always, always the, the hardest and um, so when you transition to, are you, you're, you're data, a data guy. So are you, are you more introverted uh, or more extroverted? Oh, heavily, heavily introverted. Uh, fortunately, right. my wife is very extroverted. So I'll bring her to real estate events if you can talk on my behalf. Yeah. I was going uh, yeah. to ask you about that. You know, it's, 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 it's fun. It's funny, right? It's like, uh, you know, this is a problem. The introverted guys, gals are tend to be, you know, a little bit more numbers oriented, very detail oriented, uh -huh. but they have trouble talking to people. Meanwhile, yeah, yeah. meanwhile, the extroverts have trouble with numbers. Right. And that's just why they've, they've formed such great uh, partnerships. And um, is your partner uh, your your wife or some uh, or some other partner? No, no, my wife uh, is not involved in real estate at okay. all. She's got her own startup, but yeah, my business partner is yeah unrelated. Yeah, just it's unrelated. Now, is he is he like a compliment? Is he more extrovert, or or how did you guys? Uh, why did you guys decide to work together? Uh, I don't think he is more extroverted, but him and I are both types of people. Okay, I'll also take a step back and say like introverts get a bad rap for you know being. <laughs> quiet or right. super like social yeah, I'm right. like, I, I love meeting new people i love going to events i just get tired really easily yeah so uh, so him and i are very similar that we we can have a great conversation it's just that i i won't stay out at an event for eight hours and feel exhilarated afterwards <laughs> so uh, uh -huh. so what about part him? of the, uh yes yeah, same exact way so uh -huh. uh, it's funny because sometimes we'll take shifts so like you'll go to like a morning part of the same conference i'll, I'll take it i'll take it a little easy and then we'll kind of uh move on and I'll take the afternoon so that we can still talk to the same people because they, they, most of our network know us as a group. So at least there's someone from our company there to, you know, shake hands and, and talk. But uh, yeah, the, it's, yeah, we, we've managed to, to find ways to get, nice. get around it. And yeah. How are you guys splitting up the roles in the partnership? 
Uh, so uh, I am much more of the technical back end. So I do the underwriting for us, uh, help with the systemization, uh, help, you know, if our virtual assistant needs any help with, you know, making SOPs, I'm kind of the one that takes the lead on that. I do all of the financial asset management where I, I have a, a large spreadsheet for all of the, the properties that we own, make sure that, you know, our, our bank accounts have liquidity and I uh, do the uh, construction rehab draws because I have all the numbers. And then my business partner is a boots on the ground. So he lives in Cincinnati, which is our target market. Uh, he's uh, amazing at construction. Like I, he doesn't have a background in construction, but he just knows so much about it. So he manages the contractors. Uh, he meets with the brokers in person, kind of brings up the coffee uh, and make sure that, you know, everything, you know, in person uh, goes smoothly. That's pretty cool. What about capital raising? Have you, have you raised any capital or, or how are you funding your deals? Uh, yes. So we've raised capital for our own deals, obviously. Uh, we did a uh, syndication last year that we are the lead sponsor on that we raised all the capital for directly in-house. Uh, we've also done co-sponsor deals where we've raised, uh, you know, whatever amount of money for other teams and, you know, help them with some processes or asset management. Uh, but we don't consider ourselves to be like core capital raisers as like a, a strength. Uh, we have a, a pretty good network of other capital raisers that uh, hopefully we'll continue to tap into. Uh, and we, you know, we 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 see ourselves as building more of a brand. We're not necessarily looking to you know try to raise for a specific deal, but we just like meeting people and going to events and getting our names out there. That's cool. So who's involved in the on, on the capital raising? Is that you or more your partner, or a little bit of both? Uh, a little bit of both, and uh, it's it's a role that we share just because we don't neither of us want to have that as being a like a primary role. And so uh, even like coming on to like, you know, podcasts like this, it's, it's not to raise capital for anything specifically, but it's just, uh, yeah, so that people know my face and and uh, I can meet new people. Yeah. So partnerships are so common in this business. What is what do you think uh, makes this one work? Uh, so before I met Jay, my current business partner, I tried to do the thing of like a ragtag group of random newbie investors trying to make LOIs together. And uh, in hindsight, I'm very grateful that I did not actually end up closing on any deals with the bunch of like random people that I used to make offers with. And uh, it, I met Jay very organically uh, through a network of people that I kind of just stumbled upon just by asking people, hey, what other networks are you part of? Do you have any other people that uh, would be cool to meet? And so uh, after almost like a year of networking and just asking to, to meet people, get on casual Zoom calls, like no strings attached type of things, uh, I met Jay. Uh, we got along really well. We uh, kept in touch for maybe two to three months, just over weekly Zoom calls. And then I met him in person uh, at uh, at one of the large uh, real estate events. I flew over to Cincinnati for a week to just hang out with him in person. And over that week, we were able to grab dinners, grab lunches, take a look at properties, just like have a good time, tell jokes. And I feel like that uh, only after I did all of that did I feel comfortable. Yeah, this this is the guy that's going to be my business partner. Like not. But only you met does online. Basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so, it's so common. It's so common, especially through COVID, right? And I, what I love about that is that you you met someone online on Zoom call or some co online conference, and then you just, you know, stay in touch with that person. And yeah. that's such a great way to meet so many people. I mean, yes, jumping in a plane is great, but you can do so much also online. I love how you did that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I feel like there's uh, a lot of people think that there's some like, you know, secret sauce to finding a partner, but it's just like, you know, good old fashioned networking, just you got to try a few things out and yeah, see if you can connect with the right individual. Well, let's talk about group. let's talk about your first uh, first deal or, or second deal. What, what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, switching from single family to, to multifamily? Uh, getting more of the background in how multifamily is built was actually quite difficult. So in, in single families, I used to spend like forty to fifty thousand dollars for a renovation because it was a, a single family home. And multifamily, I've now learned even anything above twenty thousand is pretty expensive. And so cutting down on costs was a, a definitely a major hurdle. And even understanding how you know utilities were set up that they're they're metered separately and I can track them individually per tenant, or if not, I have to, you know, provide, you know, charge back rubs. And so the the actual nuances of the differences, uh, it took some time for me to internalize just because I was so familiar with, you know, I've, I've got a house, I've got one tenant living in there, and then that that is what it is. Um, and I think multifamily is much more of a business than single families is. Uh, one, single families I can take down by myself. I don't, don't have to be held accountable to business partners or passive investors. Uh, but with multifamily, even the uh, underwriting, right? I, I would not call single family home analysis underwriting. It's more, you know, you can do it on like a single Excel spreadsheet and just be like, I pay this much. 
I'm going to refi this money. It's like very simple back of the napkin math, but with multifamily, because you've got returns that you have to give because you have a GP shares, because you have, you know, a, a bunch of other levers that you need to pull, you have to model it, which I actually enjoy much more, but uh, the, it, it became, I feel like I, I wouldn't necessarily call myself like a single family home investor. I, it felt more like hobby. I was kind of trying to figure it out. But uh, when I entered multifamily, and, and now I feel much more like a multifamily investor who's doing this professionally. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> One sec. I literally was going to try to hold it 19. I got to write that down, 19. I had it f planned out in my head, and then it went away. Hold on. Damn it. It was great. It was a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know I ramble a lot. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you're 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 fine. All right, I got I got. Um... All right. Well, it escaped me. We'll we'll move more to the to the um, the number side of things. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. As you you mentioned analysis a lot, right? Uh, and you're your data and data guy, and that's what you do. That that's what your your job was. Now, tell me what was your last day of work like because people knew about jason the data guy you know whatever what was that like what reaction did you get uh so a lot of people actually knew that i was leaving to to not pursue another day job but try to do something uh, on my own so um i mean i worked in a great work environment uh i mean it was a lot of hours it was it was tough but uh, i liked everyone that i work with even my my bosses were great um and so the last day was actually a little bit uh relieving because i felt like i was uh, it, it's come a blur of relief and also fear and anxiety because uh, I was finally going to be able to do what I wanted to do. But also I was entering this new world where I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So it was definitely a, a blend of emotion. Um, I do have a, actually a funny story that I sometimes tell about my last day where, uh, you know, most people have like an exit interview. And I had one with my managing partner. And uh, I remember the exit interview so very clearly because she asked me how many homes I had uh, because she assumed that obviously any smart person would have some sort of experience before quitting a, a nice cushy day job. Uh, but uh, I was so nervous and I, I didn't want to admit that I was just going cold turkey. So I actually, I kind of dodged the question. I almost lied where I, I kind of brushed it. Off. I was like, oh yeah, I have a few homes, but you know, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, keep getting some more. Um, and I remember just because it was such a funny moment in hindsight that I felt like I had to white lie to my boss, who I was very close with, but I was almost embarrassed to admit that I was giving up my decade long career just for absolutely uh, the promise of potentially being an investor. So you quit cold turkey before you had a single house? Yeah, yeah. Barely didn't know a soffit from sofa. So yeah, cold cut. So, so why, why did you do that? Right? Because there's, there's, there's always different approaches, right? Some people, they have to, they want to get their first deal so they can see it working. Some people wait far too long. You said, screw it. I'm burning the boats. Why did you decide to do that? Uh, so as reckless as it may seem <laughs> on the surface, I, I sort of know myself uh, pretty well in that I'm really good at focusing on one thing. And I, I figured that it was actually a bigger risk to juggle both a full-time demanding day job and also try to invest because I feel like I would suck at both. And so uh, it wasn't a decision that I made like, you know, two weeks before and decided to just quit. Uh, it was years in the making where I decided to treat myself more as a startup where I would save up a little bit of runway. Like, you know, every penny I didn't need to put it towards expenses, I put it into a nice bank account and then as well, after I felt like I had enough cash, I decided to make the shift so I can devote full time attention to uh, to something that I was passionate about. And uh, the funny thing is that, like I set myself like an arbitrary number, like say it's like, you know, uh, yeah, at, like X. Right. Uh, even after I passed it, it still took me three months to put my two weeks notice in just because it's uh, it's it's uh, a lot. It's frightening to to make that big of a jump. But I always figured that. Uh, I'm married, so my life is pretty stable. I don't have kids, so it's not that chaotic. So I figured if I don't do it now, I'm going to regret it. I'm not going to be able to, you know, enjoy this level of uh, bandwidth uh, in, in, the, in the near future. So I figured I, I had to take the leap. So how did your wife react? You know, you're quitting your job and now you're loafing around at 2.30 in the afternoon when you're supposed to be at work. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's incredibly supportive. Uh, so funny enough, she made the leap into uh, entrepreneurship a few years before. And I so I blame her because I was jealous of the type of life that she was uh, leading. And so she started like a cybersecurity startup. And 
So we didn't plan it this perfectly, but I still had a, you know, a nice high paying day job uh, when she quit her career to do her startup full time. And then a few years later, once she had a little bit of traction, she was making enough money where, you know, she could pay her bills easily. Uh, that's when I felt like I just like subconsciously was like, now is the time for me to make the move. Uh, because I felt like we weren't going to starve. We're like, we, we weren't going to, you know, like get kicked out of our house because I couldn't pay the mortgage. Um, so it was, it was like a phased effort, but it, it wasn't planned that way at all. It, it sort of just happened that way. That's awesome. They'll brag a little bit. How many, how many, uh, how, how many units do you have right now? And, and roughly how much money were you able to raise? Uh, today about, uh, 350 units, uh, apartments. I, I still own the seven single family homes, uh, that I own. And in terms of money raised, yeah, we're not capital raisers, but we've raised, you know, a few million dollars, um, in the, in the last few years for, for our own projects. And when we're co-sponsors, it'll be like much smaller amounts, but, um, just to get, you know, in on deals with all that, other operators. That's amazing. Jason, that's fantastic. Uh, now you, you said, um, well, you said that, you know, numbers are super important for investing, real estate investing. Why do you, why do you think it's so important? Uh, that's a great question. I think, um, as a data person, I always say that, you know, I, I, I can trust numbers. Uh, and I can see through numbers, especially when words can hide things. And so I I love the idea that uh, numbers are objective, that they are, you know, the closest source to truth. And I, I love marketing. I love sales. Very important. But for me as a data person, it's a lot easier for me to look at a spreadsheet, uh, tear it apart and understand something that I am afraid that you might be hiding. Um I, I'm always the pessimist. I'm always the one that always thinks worst case scenario. And so, uh, yeah, much prefer to make sure that I understand the numbers portion of it, that I feel comfortable with the level of risk that's being undertaken uh, before blindly trusting someone with, with you know, X amount of money. And uh, I, I think that's actually a common uh, misconception, too, in uh, multifamily real estate and also underwriting, where uh, you know, if you're not number savvy, you might think like, oh, you just find anyone who's good with numbers and they can be your underwriter. But uh, even if you find a good underwriter, your risk tolerances might be very different. And even if I'm not meaning to screw you over, if I think a deal is perfectly fine, but it might actually be too risky for you, I, I don't know, like I can't read your mind. And so there might be miscommunication. And so um, I always think that people should at least understand the basics of being able to analyze a deal so that you can just make the right decision for, for your investing journey. Now, we have an analysis tool called a syndicated deal analyzer, probably the most widely used analysis tool on the planet now. And you found that earlier on. Um, and, and how are you using or how did you start using it or how are you using it now? Yeah, it was uh, I, I, I don't know if it was the first one I found, but it's definitely the one that I use for the longest and the most frequent. And I think I actually found it just through word of mouth. I would ask people, hey, like, what are you using to take a look at multifamily deals? And, you know, absolutely everyone would say Michael Blanc's SDA. And so um, I kind of found it organically. And um, it was one of the ones that because so many people were used to using it, that uh, me learning how to uh, pull the levers of that specific model helped me speak the same language as everyone else. And so it was a uh, tremendous help in sort of bridging that gap, especially because I, I had no idea what was going on when I first started in multifamily. And so being able to talk the same language, being able to show people like, hey, I could fill in this model and I know how to play around with some things of it, uh, kind of had people trust me more, even though I didn't have direct experience that I could at least understand the basics of the, the business of multifamily investing. And so, yeah, it was a, a great resource. The best, uh, I don't know how much you charge for it today, but the best, like, you know, a few hundred dollars that I ever spent. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, if you guys want to check out the SDA syndicated deal analyzers at themichaelblank.com forward slash SDA. And it's a great way to start underwriting deals that you were coming across on LoopNet, et cetera, kind of like Jason did is a great way to kind of get your feet wet. Now, how are you? Uh, I mean, the, the market is always changing very rapidly. Um, mm -hmm. How are you adjusting your underwriting right now to look at deals right now? Uh, yeah, so uh, the underwriting business, or sorry, the, the business of multifamily that we uh, look to enact hasn't really changed uh, across, you know, different markets. And so uh, we still have a value add business plan that we're looking to buy stuff for uh, the right price, inject human capital and, you know, build up that equity uh, with, with that strategy. Uh, the way that underwrite 
uh, has had some tweaks. We definitely don't factor in a refi anymore just because, you know, two years ago, you could bank that refi rates were going to be relatively in your favor. So today I don't try to factor in a refi. I'll, I'll, I'll tell my investors that hopefully I take out, you know, a supplemental loan in 18 months so that we can return some cash. But I don't want to make assumptions just because, you know, it's volatile. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I read uh, or I try to stay on top of in terms of, you know, macroeconomic trends. But at the end of the day, everyone's still, you know, making educated guesses. So I, I try to keep the bar very low every time I take a look at a deal. Um, similarly, whenever we're, you know, projecting rent growth, I try to keep it on the low end uh, so that we're not aggressive and we're banking on, you know, natural market appreciation to carry our deals forward. Um, and yeah, we're, we're always also making offers at the numbers that make this the most sense for us. We, we've typically always done that, but more so than ever, we're kind of sticking to our numbers. Uh, and fortunately, we, we've actually experienced where a lot of sellers are uh, a little bit more reasonable. They're, they're willing to meet us maybe halfway between our offer and their asking. Uh, now we don't have to do hard EMD anymore. We don't have to close in 30 days. So there's a few concessions on the seller side. And so we kind of stick hold, uh, sorry, we, we hold strong to our criteria. And uh, we're we're not really desperate for our next deal, so we're kind of just waiting for for whoever comes along our way. What are your What are your goals uh, for you this year from the on the buying side or anything like that? Uh, yeah, so we definitely want to grow. Uh, I think even today, so I meet with my business partner Jay on a daily basis, pretty much. Uh, and even today, we continue to talk through what this market means for us. And for us to keep evolving and, and stay on top of things. Uh, last year, we wanted to try and scale and, you know, take on bigger deals, stick to 100, 150 unit deals. But even today, they're still a little overpriced. And so we're doubling down on DTS efforts. So even if we can find a solid 40 unit that has amazing returns, uh, maybe that will be our focus. So um, we're, we're actually trying to stay nimble and try to react uh, in real time to how the market shifts and not necessarily be too focused on we definitely like we always need to take down a hundred unit because we're in a like a tertiary market Cincinnati so it's not like the deal flow is is tremendous so we have to yeah go along with the flow a little bit more that's awesome Jason how can people connect with you uh yeah so I mean I'm active on LinkedIn and Facebook uh Jason Bake B-A-I-K uh our website is compoundingcapitalgroup.com uh, I also uh, teach other people how to underwrite. So if you're interested in, you know, learning a bit more about how I've learned, uh, the underwritinglab.com is is uh, my education platform. So That's awesome. Are, yeah, nice. That's great. So check out Jason, follow him and see what he's doing. It's been great to talk to you about the importance of numbers and, of course, getting started with multifamily real estate. So thanks so much for being on the show today.